Good afternoon. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining our Faculty of Agricultural and Food Sciences conversation series. We had a large number of participants in our first virtual seminar on October 21st. And for those of you that took part, welcome back. For those that missed it, you can still watch it uh, if you uh, log into our faculty YouTube channel. We also have a relatively new outreach website called the Manitoba Agriculture and Food Knowledge Exchange. You can find it at makemanitoba.ca. It's a collection of podcasts and other materials to help highlight our faculty's research as it relates to consumers and producers. Please check it out. My name is Annemieke Vernorst, and I'm the Associate Dean of the Faculty of Agricultural and Food Sciences at the University of Manitoba. I would like to acknowledge that the University of Manitoba is located on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota and Dene peoples and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past. And we dedicate ourselves to moving forward in partnership with indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. So welcome again to our seminar series. We are calling it the Faculty Conversation. The title of today's seminar series is the 4R Nutrient Stewardship Framework in the Research Outreach Advising Continuum. We have three speakers today who will each tell you a little bit about their research and then they will engage together in a conversation. You as the viewer can also participate in the conversation by sending in your questions and comments via the chat platform. So now I would like to call upon Crystal Jurgensen, who is the faculty's communication specialist, to provide some guidance on how the audience can participate in the today's presentation. Crystal. Thank you, Annemika. During today's faculty conversation, we hope that you, our viewers, will participate by sharing your comments and questions. You can do that through the chat platform Slido and you'll see the URL uh, across the bottom there. When you get to that site, enter the event code hashtag 4Rnutrient. And please note that you're limited to 160 characters, so you'll need to be concise in your comments or questions. And we will share your questions with our speakers at the Q&A portion of today's session. So maybe just to kick it off, let us know where you're tuning in from. And I'll send it back to you, Anamika. Thanks, Crystal. That's a great idea to, to know where people are tuning in from. Uh, I suggest we, we review the uh, instructions again uh, when we start the question and, and comment section at, uh, at the end of the seminar. So our topic today explores 4R Nutrient Stewardship Program uh, and how, uh, along with our para, uh, partners in government and industry, are working to improve soil and environmental health along with profitability for producers. Now, for those that are unaware what the 4R nutrient concept is about, the R stands for being right. It's the application of the right fertilizer at the right rate, at the right time and in the right place. The 4R nutrient concept is important because of the fact that the continued crop production gains are dependent on, upon better use of nutrient additions to soils. The benefits are important to the profitability of farms and also to the health of the environment. And so the 4R nutrient stewardship framework is evolving to help and support sustainable food production systems. Today's guests will explore this topic in the context of prairie farmers. They will cover current research as well as extension and advising efforts that are supporting the program. I'd like to introduce three speakers during the seminar today. And I would first like to welcome Dr. Mario Tenuta. Mario holds a BSc in Botany and Physical Geography 
an MSc in soil science and a PhD in plant science. And he also has postdoctoral experience in nematology. Mario joined the Department of Soil Science in 2002 when he became one of my colleagues. And his research there focuses on soil health, including improving nitrogen use efficiency, mitigation of greenhouse gases, and comparing sustainability of production systems across the prairies. Mario was recently appointed the NSERC Industrial Research Chair in 4R Nutrient Stewardship. He previously served as the Canadian Research Chair in Applied Soil Ecology. Mario is a very skillful communicator, often speaking to the media and using social media, as well as pre presenting at outreach events to share research findings. So Maria, the, Mario, the floor is yours. Oh, well, thank you, Anamika. Um, thanks for the invitation to uh, um, be with everybody today and to share our uh, uh, endeavors and direction with uh, for our research. What I would like to start off with is a very brief, which is very unusual for me, as if, if, if you know me, <laughs> uh, in terms of um, uh, slides to just set the background about the four R's. And the very first thing I'd like you to, to take note of is that our nitrogen use for crop production in Manitoba is um, increasing. So we are improving our yields or average yields for, this is an example of for our major field crops, every year the yields are increasing. However, that increase in yields is codependent on more nitrogen fertilizer use. This is data from Manitoba Crop Insurance. Now, are we able to continue this? For example, in 2050, 2080, are we going to be able to sustain fertilization rates of 300 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare? Um, that's probably not going to be the case because with use of uh, fertilizers, there is going to be some loss to the environment. And as we have higher and higher rates in the future, uh, that a percentage of that loss becomes a lot more loading to the environment. And that has a lot of issues that we've been dealing with in my laboratory. We've made great gains. And uh, those gains have been allowed by using the nutrient, uh, the 4R nutrient stewardship framework. And I just want to review what that means. Well, the right rate means uh, taking into account what nitrogen's in the soil that's available, tailoring the amount of fertilizer to the crop needs, treating your fields individually and even within a field, treat areas and zones differently in terms of their rates. In the right source, we have a explosion. I mean, it's true, an explosion. I, I shouldn't say that with fertilizers. Um, we, we have this tremendous uh, innovations with fertilizer sources as particularly with uh, enhanced uh, efficiency uh, fertilizers uh, that uh, we have found that dramatically reduce nitrous oxide emissions, which is one of those key, key uh, impacts on the environment we want to reduce. And placement of where we put that fertilizer incorporated or banded, farmers can do so much from our, that we're finding with our research just by where they put the fertilizer and reducing losses. Get it away from where it's going to be lost, such as the environment, get it in soil, concentrate it. So you have the fertilizer helps protect itself from, from losses. And lastly, the right timing, which is get the fertilizer or apply the nutrients to the crop when the crop needs it or soon when the crop needs it and don't have the fertilizer just stewing in the ground, in the soil. And, and then can be lost through leaching or um, wetting events, flooding, and so forth. And uh, with that, I just want to introduce to you our goal of the CHAIR program, which is really increase nitrogen uh, fertilizer use efficiency, use it better, get more of it in the crop, and reducing the environmental impacts. And that really means reducing ammonia losses, nitrous oxide, and leaching losses. Our approach in the program 
is to really focus on uh, a uh, very prominent fertilizer in Manitoba that we um, haven't really studied on the best four R's for it to reduce um, negative impacts in environment and for improved uh, yield, which is anhydrous ammonia, particularly looking at nitrification inhibitors and, um, and, and to improve fall um, uh, applications of anhydrous uh, ammonia and reduce losses. And we're gonna be looking at ammonia and leaching uh, with new long-term research sites in Manitoba. We're going to be doing modeling the, of the impacts of the benefits of 4Rs on reducing losses of nitrogen to the environment. We're going to summarize current 4R practices in, throughout Canada with the Fertilizer Use Survey, National Fertilizer Use Survey. And then we're going to make some uh, projections on the future emissions reductions by using 4Rs. And I think that's going to tie in with as carbon markets um, develop in Canada. And our approach is, as part of this continuum, and hence we, we Jennifer and, and John here, uh, researchers, ourselves, and then extension, consultants, advisors, retailers, to farmers, to the public. You can put policy uh, makers, government uh, folks in there uh, as well. But really, you know, we, we, we we're, we're serving um, uh, through our research a lot of stakeholders and, and, and the idea is that the information feeds and, and, and um, it's going to evolve with uh, uh, adoption and use by all these. And also they feed back to us and change how we do things, particularly the farmers. So that's all I have. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen. There we go. Thank you, Mario. Uh, thanks for that uh, that introduction to the to the topic and and the work great work you do. Uh, next, I would like to welcome John Hurt. Uh, he has a Bachelor of Science in Agriculture from the University of Guelph and an MSc in Soil Science from Purdue University. John has served previously with the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture and Food in Extension and Field Crop Research and has long served as the Soil Fertility Extension Specialist for Manitoba Agriculture and Resource Development. Currently, John is the chair of the Manitoba Soil Fertility Advisory Committee and John is also a certified crop advisor and was recognized in 2014 as the International Certified Crop Advisor of the Year. John has a passion for hunting officially designated states and uh, provincial soils. And uh, I, I've learned that he already captured eight provinces and 41 states. So with that, John, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks very much, Annamika. And I wanted to uh, uh, follow up on uh, Muriel's comments just with a little bit of show and tell of how it is that uh, I, I see our contribution in the uh, for our extension and, and uh, framework there. And I think my, my slide is probably up there and looking at our component and, and those of my partners with Manitoba Agriculture and the other parts of the government is generally the extension segment or uh, a component of that. And in doing so, uh, we partner with the university and we have here an example from one of our uh, winter extension programs where we call nutrient management. Is it a game of chance? Well, we think not. It, uh, farmers are not always at the uh, uh, at the perils of nature. There are things that we can skillfully do to manage nutrient management. So this was one of our uh, winter extension approaches to engage farmers into some of the decisions that reduce the risks of uh, some of those losses that Muriel spoke about. So we do winter extension. I, I noted here, I, I have a clean shaven Mario in the picture in the tent there. One of the uh, many activities that we've had during the summer and I've got a, a program there that uh, we worked with uh, Fertilizer Canada on. And Fertilizer Canada has uh, worked with us to run a number of uh, winter, but also particularly summer field days 
where we get to showcase some technologies or emerging uh, practices and products. And so that has been something that we, uh, we love to do. It's great to interact with farmers and others. But we had COVID in 2020, and I put this picture up here. Look at how well attended that field day is. And it was better attended than that. But with the COVID reality, we still felt it was important to continue some semblance of uh, extension of, for our principles. And so this picture is actually from one of uh, Mariel's uh, research plots looking at nitrogen practices in corn. Uh, and uh, Mariel's team was able to work with us. And you see over there on the uh, right side of the screen, we had stations recordings from Mariel, members of his team, Don Flayton and myself describing what people could be looking at uh, in that corn crop and some of the aspects. So we've been forced into some novel approaches of doing extension uh, with the COVID uh, demon that we're dealing with. Wanted to, to highlight, which I think is one really neat way that we've been working with the university, both in research and extension, getting information out to the field faster. And I, I, I've kind of coined it here, the Olympic approach. And the Olympic approach is there's gold, silver, and bronze. We often think of the gold level research as being something like this behind us. Here is Amy Marget's uh, nitrogen work that she did with uh, spring wheat developing uh, guidelines for uh, nitrogen for yield and for protein. And we can see it's a complicated experiment. There are numerous nitrogen rates, numerous nitrogen sources, and some selected timings. There's just a, lo a lot of uh, uh, measurements being compared. And there were at controlled sites where uh, detailed measurements of soil and, and tissue nitrogen could be done over the course of the year. The thing that's really focused on small plots and being done at a research site, a research station. We, we did some of these same treatments with contractors, uh, some in fields and some at our Manitoba uh, diversification center sites, but with a reduced number of treatments and with less uh, uh, less detailed research monitoring. We refer to those as our silver level sites. And then I had the opportunity to work with what we coined our, our bronze level sites. And that is taking segments of that detailed trial and taking it to farmers to evaluate themselves in on-farm tests. So we had farmers studying three rates of nitrogen within their field in replicated tests. Another on-farm test looked at, well, what about comparing two different sources of nitrogen, a conventional source and an enhanced efficiency source? And then the third component we looked at, what about a base rate of nitrogen? And then what about coming back in season with a specialized uh, treatment to look at enhancing protein? So here we are. We start with a, a very detailed research project and then we end up taking it to the field, which for us, if the, these things are working, will uh, mean quicker adoption by farmers. So I look at this picture here and I say, here is Amy Marget, Mario Tenuta, Don Flayton, laboring away with these small plot studies. And here myself and, and Jen Sabarin that are gonna be speaking soon, we get to work with real farmers with field scale equipment to evaluate some of those selected or promising treatments. And, and now to, to one of the other things I just wanted to note, Mario did mention that Fertilizer Canada is working with us on the 4R approach with uh, fertilizer use surveys. These are telephone surveys of farmers. And I've put one slide up here looking at uh, Manitoba corn farmers a survey of some 96. And this particular slide looks at how do you decide what nitrogen rate to use on your corn crop? 
And it's very encouraging to see that soil testing ranks very high. Two thirds of farmers use soil testing. Uh, many also use some type of yield-based calculation based on the pounds of nitrogen required per bushel of yield. A number assess their corn fields, uh, perhaps for some in-season application. Many base guide their guidance on their past experience. And there's an increasing role of third-party consultants, folks like Jen Sabarin and uh, those working with the ag retail dealerships. I'm a little disappointed at this. I don't want uh, my boss to see that Manitoba provincial recommendations are used by one of 94, 96 farmers in Manitoba. But I like to think that our recommendations are actually used by these others. There may be a question that comes up that lets me uh, explain this a little further. Nevertheless, we're gaining some good intel through these surveys that uh, Fertilizer Canada is working with us on, and, and they're helping also to guide what's the adoption rate of for our practices. Those are my uh, 60 slides that I've boiled down, and uh, I'm back to Anamika. Thank you, John, and I'm very happy to, to hear that uh, soil testing is, uh, is popular, uh, being a soil scientist, so that, that yeah. is good news. Thank you for that. Uh, so next, I would like to welcome Jennifer Sabrin. Jennifer has a Bachelor of Science uh, as well as a Master's degree and a Bachelor's of Education, all from the University of Manitoba. Jennifer is driven by curiosity and has a passion for science and education. Along with her husband, Brunel, she is a partner in the Antera Agronomy Services, where her primary role is research manager. Antera launched their own peer group on-farm research network back in 2018 and are based in the Red River Valley and have facilitated over 100 field scale research trials over the past three years. So welcome, Jennifer, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for that introduction. And seeing as I'm likely the least known out of all the presenters today, I'll give a brief background as to why we started Antera, what we've done in the last few years, the setup for our research group, and then what we hope to work on going forward with our producers and hopefully industry and university collaborators. So the reason why we started Antera was because my husband, Brunel, he grew up farming in the Red River Valley. He's also an Aggie alumni from U of M, and he had been an agronomist for 15 plus years when he was getting a little bit frustrated with not having regional, like local answers or data for questions that the producers he was working for were asking. So he had wanted to focus more on like local issues and take and really find those relevant answers for his producers. Um, so he started to look for, um, well, we know that weather is very, is extremely variable and he wanted to take a look at collecting small data. We know that there's many different companies now that want to collect all sorts of data on, you know, whether it be national, international, global settings. But we honestly believe that it's the small data, the local data that matters first. We need to figure out what's going on here with our producers on their land prior to really expanding further to, you know, even like a, uh, you know, Western Canada, Canadian, North American or global um, time frame or, uh, you know, geography, we could say. So another thing we want to do is we really want to make sure that we increase the profitability for our producers and we want to better manage their inputs and hopefully reduce expenses because our producers, like they're, this is their livelihood. This is what they, they use that's their income. So we want to make sure that, you know, what we're learning, what we're suggesting is very beneficial to them as well as to the environment. So with our research, we also want to try and figure out what practices we should adopt and others that we're currently doing that maybe we should be stopping or rejecting. 
so with with all of those questions and maybe some frustrations, um, Antera was launched in 2014. And then after a couple of seasons of working just by himself, Brew needed some help. So that's when I joined and I took over managing the research side of things. So uh, in the last four years, the last four growing seasons since I've been with Antera, we've actually hosted over 200 on-farm field scale trials. We continue to collaborate with the U of M. I'm currently working on a cover crop project with Yvonne Lolly, and we've worked with Don Flayton as well. We work with multiple industry companies. You know, if they have new products that are going to be launched to market, often we'll get the opportunity to trial them on a field scale, um, you know, version of, uh, you know, some of the small plot work that they've already done and, uh, you know, be, be able to provide them that feedback. I'm one of the co-founders of the Red River Valley Soil Health Summit. That's something that Brew and I started uh, two years ago. COVID couldn't do it this year, um, you know, because we're really interested in regenerative ag and really starting to see how we can work with the soil and maybe minimize a little bit of our dependency on uh, some of the inputs that uh, we're seeing. As Mario mentioned, our nitrogen fertilizer rates are increased, like are, they're always going up. So we're trying to see what we can do there. And uh, yeah, so with our on-farm research network, the way we have it set up is I tend to keep it between 15 and 20 local producers. So within a 25 mile radius, because what we're trying to do is we're trying to have the same soil type where we want to have the same weather if we can, it can be hit and miss, although we do track weather at our sites. And so each producer hosts two trials. Now, as a group, we sit down, Brew and I will come up with a, a list of ideas of potential trials for the, the following growing season. And then together we will um, we'll decide who is interested in doing which trial. And then I'm, I hope to have about 12 to 14 trials per year and then replicate it on three to four different sites. So if I have 20 producers, I have 40 trial sites. Um, so not every single trial is reproduced on uh, four trial sites, but it kind of varies, depends on producer's interest, depends on their equipment, uh, you know, when they, the trial that they want and the different um, management practices that they have on their farm. From there, uh, once we have all of that set up, we handle all of the logistics. So I, I know what kind of equipment they run from openers, the sprayer wits, uh, harvest equipment, and really we do reverse planning because I wanna make harvest as efficient as possible. We know with working with producers, they are kind of short on patience in two times of the year, seeding and harvest. And those are the two times that I'm usually asking them to slow down and put trials in and then slow down to take them off at harvest. So that's one of the things that uh, producers are often a little hesitant to work with us at first because they think, oh my heavens, how am I ever going to get all this done? You know, it's go, go, go as soon as we start seeding or at harvest, that kind of thing. But when I do all of the logistical planning for them and I basically show up and say, here we go, here's the layout, this is what we have to do. They say, oh, I mean, I just have to sit in my tractor and flip a switch. Oh, I can do that. Yeah. So it's with working with us and establishing that uh, relationship that we've really been able to, you know, maintain this group and, you know, gain some pretty good knowledge. Um, also, we we're trying like we can leverage technology now that we couldn't before between um, carts, grain carts, having a scale on them, having GPS and pretty much all equipment we can record so much data the yield maps we can uh, take those from the combine so we have a lot of data that we have uh, available to us for for analyzing um, during season I also scout all the all the trial fields so they have you know somebody boots on the ground walking their walking their fields looking for you know all pesticides we make recommendations and you know really just bringing that, that special specialization to um, what we do with the trials. And um, 
Then again, at Harvest, we are there with our way wagon if we don't want to use their cart, um, if it doesn't have a scale. Then, so we're there in the field to actually collect a sample so we can take a look at moisture grain quality. And it really like forces the producers like to slow down and take a minute versus saying, oh, forget it, you know, I'm stressed, it's it's too late or it's, the weather's gonna change. I'm just gonna, just gonna harvest. So that really helps us gather that knowledge. And because our field, our trials are so big, they're approximately like 30 to 40 acres each. Um, we do six replicates of all, uh, all treatments. Sometimes it's alternating strips, sometimes it's randomized complete block design, depending on how many treatments we have. So it can be a, you know, a portion of their field. However, we do, you know, relieve some stress by saying harvest everything else and leave the trial for dessert. So you can come back and then there's less stress and um, things usually go pretty smoothly. Um, as I'd mentioned earlier, we do collect weather data so we can compare if we have some outliers in some of the uh, data that we collect, uh, we can try and figure out or we can explain why we're seeing that particular outcome. Um, and then at the end, I have, I produce a report that shows data from every single trial site, as well as we do a combination of all, uh, all the data together so they can have a collective uh, result. Uh, that information, those reports are for just members of the group. Uh, we do not produce, uh, we don't publish anything online or whatnot. Um, as well, we also do these on farm, like field scale trials with industry and that data we don't publish either because it belongs to the company. So we, we give it back to them and it's for their marketing. Um, and it's up to them what they do with it. Um, so in terms of the four R stewardship framework, uh, our trials, you know, they've often focused on new fertilizers, uh, you know, different placements. Uh, using these fertilizers with, you know, different equipment, you know, for example, if it's shovels versus uh, discs versus knife openers, uh, we can take a look at those different kinds of things. Timing of fertilizer application, whether we have split application all in spring, fall versus spring, uh, you know, with the variable weather that we can have, especially here in the Red River Valley. I mean, in the last, in, in 12 months, we had three floods here. So that's, kind of a tough uh, situation to deal with. So, you know, it's good that we are try like we're doing trials with different sources, uh, different products like of nitrogen fertilizers and other fertilizers, just to see so that our producers are comfortable with working with different products. Um, our large trials capture variability in a field and that really brings it home for the producers because very, very good data comes out of small plot like trials, um, but the, the the data and like the the variable that what we can get in terms of our our CV and our uh, standard deviation is it's pretty it's pretty precise, um, and and often like as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, a lot of trials were not done in the Red River Valley because of the soils that we have here. So it's really good to be focusing in on the Red River Valley and the soils that we have here. Um, we do analyze some of like the new uh, fertilizers with the uh, enhanced efficiencies uh, added to them. And, you know, the peer group format, you know, it really, it helps producers share ideas a lot of like if you look back at you know how farming is often you're in competition with your neighbor for a piece of land if it comes up for rent or for sale so you want to keep your heart your cards really close to you but within our peer group there's an ability for sharing which is great you know and sometimes producers can ask others in the group in like a safe area where you know uh, what about this type of fertilizer or this method uh, split timing those kinds of things so that's kind of how our research group works. And uh, yep, some of the goals that we're looking for in the future is, uh, you know, with regenerative ag, we have producers that really want to, um, you know, really improve the health of their soil. So we're looking, like I said, we're currently working with Avon Lolly on some cover crop trials, but we're also looking to, uh, to carry that on and uh, find some other, you know, potential funding opportunities or other researchers to collaborate with to uh, look a little bit more into soil health and regenerative ag.
Thanks a lot, Jennifer. Uh, thank you for um, informing us on the diverse thing that uh, things that Antera is is doing. And uh, you touched a little bit about on the uh, research continuum. So, so how do we connect research with with producers and and perhaps you know in a broader sense with uh, with consumers? Uh, and John and Mario are are back online as well. And and I just wonder if you, the three of you, uh, could uh, chat a little bit more and and. Uh, um, tell us about you know the type of producers that are interested to be actually involved in the, these field trials. Uh, whether you also are reaching out to to maybe non-producers, so so the city uh, individuals living in the city. Um, so I don't know who wants to to start off. Okay. Well, Normal, normally a very chatty bunch, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, no, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in there because uh, I think that uh, we do work with a select group when we're putting together not only on-farm test trials, but even uh, research trials for Mario and, and Dawn and others. And that's usually the uh, one of the requests that we get come uh, February when someone will come to Mario and give him a bag of money and say, we need more research on this. <laughs> And so then Mario will come to us saying, well, find us some farmers that will do this. And uh, I, when I look for cooperators, it's important. It's, it's someone that has an interest in it. And we're, we're fortunate. We've worked through the commodity associations, the corn growers and others. They frequently have a, uh, you know, a, a, some very active directors who are committed to learning new things. Uh, but I also say, and I, I put a shout out to any audience there, is that if if you're a student of Don Flayton's or Mariel's at university, your education did not stop there. And you still have an opportunity to learn on your farm. And you should not only be willing to host trials when I happen to call, you should be actively seeking trials. Uh, and uh, I still think the most successful trials are, are, are Don's past students uh, who he, he's planted the bug in them. And uh, that, that is part of your continuing education to host uh, research trials. And, and that's the research stations, but also uh, for my part in uh, floating ideas or getting things out there. I work with groups similar to Jen in that I'm looking at uh, innovative farmers. And because I, I don't reach many farmers, but if I can reach some selected farmers, others will watch what happens. Well, well they'll, they'll watch who is successful and they can uh, follow along that way. So yeah. uh, that's kind of the approach that I'm taking. It's nice to work with innovators. It's no fun working with losers. Uh, we have people in the department <laughs> that have to chase the losers. Those are people who deal with regulations, uh, people with nutrient levels that are too high in the soils, losers. I get to work with winners uh, because we're working with folks that are uh, innovate, innovators and willing to try new things. I don't mean the others are losers. It just means that they need some incentive in order to bring things back on track. Yeah, I'll and do you also... Oh, oh, sorry. Do, I, I'm just also wondering, I, I live in a rural community and, and um, not now, but, but in, in any normal year, so to speak, uh, you know, people getting together for coffee in the local uh, shop, so to speak. Do you find that um, that that your if if a producer works with you on field trials in a particular area that that then other producers actually become curious and and maybe want to sign up as well for for field trials? I see Jennifer yeah. not there. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I I like the model that that Jen has, and we've nurtured that um, on farm testing. It's not cheaper, really, and it's not less work. It's still a lot of work, but it really helps farmers to answer their own question on their own farm, on their own soils, 
And it's it's better when, as Jen's able to combine sites. Once we have people involved in Amica, it's amazing. They get hooked. And if I can refer back to some of my colleagues in Ontario that have not this a little longer, they find that that farmers, when they're at meetings and they hear a slickster talking about a new product or whatever, they'll stand up and they'll ask, how many replications? How many sites? Was it significant? And if those questions can't be answered, it's coffee shop talk. It's not talk you take to the bank. It's you leave it at the coffee shop. Farmers now are, are recognizing the value in having uh, uh, well done trials, ones they can rely on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But Jennifer, Mary, party, we're, we're... Oh, no, go ahead. Yes, please. Oh, sorry. Uh, I was just going to say. I was just going to say, like, we're a third party, completely unbiased. We're not trying to sell anything to anyone. And that's one of the things that a lot of our group members really appreciate. Because, for example, if there's a season where we haven't had much rain and there isn't, say, fusarium pressure, we can say, no, you don't need to spray. And even though like, so I'm in those fields looking at my trials, no, nope, there's no disease pressure. You don't need to spray. Well, then there is an immediate benefit financial benefit, time benefit from doing a trial because I'm in there looking at at that particular site. And also they they then get to uh, have all the, the data from all the trial sites combined. So they're not, they're hosting two trials, but they're getting data from 40 sites. So they didn't have to do all the work from 40 sites. And then they're also they might be interested in 10 different trials, but they're only hosting two. So they really have a wealth of knowledge that comes in with the report. And uh, it's something that is, like John said, it's a lot of work, but it's, I find there's a lot of value to it. Mm -hmm. And then maybe Mario, um, so so if uh, if farmers participate, and of course they get their, their data from their own site, but, but how do you sort of, bring this all together and, and inform the whole uh, community? Yeah, um, well, one aspect is the field tours. So John was showing you uh, one of our, uh, our tours from this summer, which was one of two. We had two sites, a canola site and a, and a corn site, two different producers. And um, we we asked them and, and they say, no problem. We, we host the uh, tours on their, um, Farms in in some well most years we ha we our tours are um, a a true tour it's it's kind of like a um, bar hopping thing but it's a it's field hopping and we all have two or three and we'll we'll you know we'll go to Don's trial site on a farmer's field and we'll go to mine and it, John has. Uh, a really good grower that he's been working with and has, has done a demo on and we go there. So so uh, that really is awesome. And then we we have the, the farmer at the, the field tour as well. And they, they love that. And, you know, their buddies right. are there. The community is there. It's, it's really good. And then yeah, uh, right. so there's that. And then we communicate with we have about a good four to five uh, producers. Right now we're kind of in the Carmen area, Carmen, um, Haywood, uh, St. Claude area. So we've got nice core growers there of uh, mainly corn growers. And um, so we come back, we come back to them year after year and they, they ask what's happening and we, we share the information with them. And so, uh, yeah, they like it. And actually, they'll call up and say, "Hey, are you coming? You coming to my fields this um, year or not, or next year?" Yeah, wonderful. So one of the things I like to to mention is our, especially with the four R's. There's so many combinations of treatments. Our experiments are very large and massive, and particularly now that we're moving to evaluating four R's different suites of 4R practices and rates of nitrogen to see how the most economical rate of nitrogen will, will change with the practices. It should change. We hope it improves it. Uh, and uh, so our sites are massive. We're talking 130, 150 plots 
Mm -hmm. Carmen Research Station cannot accommodate that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We need uh, certain nitrogen levels in the soil uh, or preceding crop. Uh, and we can, we can talk to our farmers and they can provide us a field. We talk to them about the field conditions that we need. And they say, yep, I got this uh, field for you. And they give me the legal description and we Google it and do a site visit and stuff like that. So we, we can do things that we just can't do. Yeah. Uh, uh, so it's um, otherwise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it, yeah. No, it's great. Yeah. I I just wonder uh, because the audience may have uh, a wide range of questions as well, and so I'm going to uh, ask Crystal to to remind us how we can actually ask questions. Hi guys, I'm back. Um, yeah. So uh, you'll see the. Uh, URL crawling across the bottom there, go visit that on a different window or on your phone, uh, www.slido.com, enter the event code hashtag for our nutrient. Uh, just a reminder, you're limited to 160 characters. Um, and we uh, we had originally asked where people were checking in from. We had a few Winnipeg, uh, Killarney, St. Jean Baptiste, uh, Notre Dame de Lourdes, uh, Transcona, so we've got them from all over the place. Um, but the first question comes to us from Paul Bullock and he's asking, do fertilizer recommendations mainly come from soil testing labs? How do they keep updated with the higher fertilizer needs of high yielding crops? <laughs> Great question. Who wants to tackle that one? Well, well I could take a, a crack at that because obviously uh, for, the, for the sample slide I had, uh, Two thirds of farmers do rely heavily on the soil testing. And how do, uh, like a lot of those companies uh, are actually supporters of our research. Uh, they'll support us with testing fees and things. So uh, that they do uh, widely tend to adopt some of our guidelines as they come along. Uh, now, I, I, I should make apologies. You know, that slide showed that provincial guidelines were not very used. Well, to be honest, they were not very relevant. Uh, I don't, Paul's a young fellow. He maybe doesn't remember back to 1992 when we privatized the Manitoba soil testing lab. But since that time, uh, stewardship or a necessity to update recommendations has kind of fallen off the table. It's only when uh, uh, real crusades take place through the commodity associations, the corn growers, the wheat growers, uh, good funding to go to you know folks like Mary or Dawn, that's when we get to really dig into some research and produce new and relevant guidelines. Once we've done that, yes, we do uh, hope that uh, soil test labs embrace that. And if they don't, then uh, go to some of our public websites uh, and uh, simply use their analytical results and our recommendations. Thanks, John. This, I'll just add to that question? for our clients. Oh, sorry. Oh, I was just going to add that for our clients. We we get the uh, what's that? No, but uh, go, go I was just going to say that we we take. A look. <laughs> we we take a look at the soil test results and. Uh, Brew, he's the expert. He's the one that'll make all the fertility recommendations for our our clients. So sometimes some clients do ask to have, or people that we sample for, they'll ask for the AgVise recommendations for a specific yield on uh, the upcoming crop. But generally, we do we do it in house, and Brew takes care of that. Okay, thank you. Crystal, is, is there another question in the Yeah, queue? Yeah, we've got about three more questions that have come in here. Roy or not, or not has asked, has there been any trials on comparing rates or recommendations for broadcast N and P versus banding? I'll, um, I'll take a stab at that first and, and uh, others can, can jump in. So this is a, um, a little uh, sweet spot for me in terms of I, I love this because of the placement because oh man it, farmers have a lot of control 
just by where they put the fertilizer and when they put it in. And this, this is a great question because um, there's been research on this since, you know, when fertilizers, um, particularly uh, nitrogen and phosphorus have been used on the prairies, uh, actually the University of Manitoba is very much the, the leader in this, in examining the benefit of banding and also uh, Cindy Grant, our, our product of, of the, the soil science department and our faculty, and uh, of course in, in Brandon, that has just recently retired. And um, the for both nitrogen and phosphorus, there is a benefit to banding, subsurface banding, to um, by concentrating the fertilizer products, it can, uh, to make it simple, it slows down the transformations and, uh, and um, uh, slows down and reduces the rate at which the, for phosphorus combine with the soil and be unavailable to plants or with nitrogen to keep it in a non-mobile form such as ammonium. And so uh, it, it, this is a, a great question and it's, uh, there's so much research and our research continues to indicate that banding is um, superior uh, from a phosphorus standpoint and from a, um, a nitrogen standpoint. So band, band, band if you can. And there's you know a little bit of um, questions about is it mid row banding or or side banding in terms of do you skip a row make it more concentrated or not uh, I, I don't care too much about that get it under the ground in a band uh, is is the way to go um, others I would well, agree with that Mario except for. Except for when we have a spring flood yeah. and a fall flood, so then we we can't we we understand the benefits of of banding, but when you can't get into the field to be able to do that, then that's where we see, for example, last fall this spring we saw a lot of fields that were broadcast and harrowed in be, right before seeding because they couldn't do it any other way. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, I agree with you, and that's. One of the aspects about the four R's, it's not a regimented set in stone recommendation. It's a recommendation based on the conditions and availability and the circumstances. So if the soil is is not super wet, like often it is in fall and spring in, in, in the valley, uh, and you can band uh, and, and you have the equipment and so forth, then band. If you can't band, you know, if you're broadcasting, maybe then uh, that's where an enhanced efficiency fertilizer comes in to reduce the losses um, then. And so, um, that, so uh, yeah, I agree with you. But, you know, I just wanted to stress the point that the four R's give some flexibility. Basically, it's, it's not like the ultimate uh, practices. It's the best practices for the situation um, uh, at any time. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thank you both, uh, or three of you. Um, Crystal, uh, are there any other questions in, yeah. in the queue? We have a few more, but all this talk of bands and bar hopping make me want to go dancing. Um, <laughs> Der Derek, Bruin, Derek Bruin is asking, is there any chance of forages soybean rotations to supply long-term nitrogen needs? Well, uh, oh, John, did you want to go or me? Or oh, well, let, let me slam the soybeans first. So, uh, <laughs> soybeans are, are, are a legume crop, and they do produce their own nitrogen. But we have found that they are not a contributor of nitrogen. They uh, harvest it all. They they package most of it in the seed. They leave precious little. They leave enough in their in their leaves that the leaves decompose, but they're not soil builders of nitrogen. They look after themselves. And uh, if you're thinking that it is contributing nitrogen, you have to go back to your uh, fertility classes with Don Flayton. It's just that because there's less residue, there's some nitrogen in it, there's less immobilization than there is if you're putting down one, two, three, or four tons of uh, cereal straw or corn. 
So it's an immobilization thing. It's not a nitrogen credit thing. Put my stake through the heart of soybeans. Your turn, Mario. Tell us about forages. Well, as you know, there there are other legumes that uh, can be, provide more service than the than the soybean. But a, a little thing that is telling is where do we uh, cite our trials, our nitrogen response trials? We we search soybean fields, soybean stubble, because they have the lowest residual nitrates, uh, and we get the best nitrogen responses following soybean crop. Uh, so anyway, that just tells you in terms of a nitrogen credit kind of thing from soybean, that doesn't happen. But other legumes, it's possible, especially the forage legumes. So, you know, uh, there's uh, good research, excellent research that has shown in rotations uh, in, in using relying on biological fixed nitrogen via legumes uh, and uh, can supply the nitrogen. We can make nitrogen, plants can make nitrogen, as long as you're not demanding too much nitrogen in the rotation with the other crops, one can devise a system. And, and uh, Martin Enns has a system at Glen Lee and at Carmen, and you can see sustainable uh, crop production uh, with uh, forages and legumes in, in the rotation. Now, are you going to be able to sustain uh, high yielding grain production every year? Uh, no, um, but in a rotation and depending on what, what the farmer wants in terms of for, for market. So, uh, so I would say to Derek, yes, it is very much possible uh, if, if it matches with the farmer's goal of what they want to be marketing. If they wanted to market canola, and wheat uh, every year and soybean every year then on a field, then that's probably not going to be working. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, there we go. Thank you. Uh, time flies. Uh, we have about three minutes. Maybe oh. one more question, Crystal? Yeah, and I just want to add, there was a comment that came in in relation to Derek's question, and it was from Martin Entz, and he said, Getting sufficient N into organic, the cropping through forage legumes, cover crops, and grain legumes is economic and practical. So he is confirming that. Um, the final question is from Martin Scanlon, and he is asking, so is the future of research integrating data from on-farm trials and not small plots? Mm. I don't, I don't well, think that, that it's... That. Okay, so the reason we have our research group set up in our region is because we wanted to have small data localized for the producers that we work with here. I can't be driving all over the province or Western Canada to be scouting you know, trials and stuff like that. Uh, I think it's a very good complement to what the university does and the findings from their research. And then if we have if we have something that's very interesting, then let's try and see if it can be economical. As was just mentioned, are you gonna have high yield, like grain crops following uh, forages? Not likely. And these are things that we're gonna have to take a look at with, you know, say carbon credits and sequestration and stuff like that. We know that those are kind of, uh, that's a route that we're gonna be moving down. So we have to take a look at how we can, you know, kind of combine that, but also keeping the, uh, the profitability of the producer up there because if they're not making a profit it's going to be tough to convince them to move away from those practices mm -hmm. but i still think that a lot of information comes from the university that we test in field scale can i can i make a, a, a quick comment there Anamika? very um, quick mario <laughs> I, I think i think you know martin must be thinking about the future uh as he should as a dean um because that's a great question because when we move to, uh, let's say like the digital agriculture and moving to the needs of the future, we are going to be uh, in a situation where the small plots are going to be, have their uh, purpose, but they're, they're gonna provide limited uh, information. We are going to need to be moving to larger scale, larger 
scale machinery. And we have a big question to ask. Does the University of Manitoba, should it be picking up that equipment and that investment, or should we be working? Should we be working with Jen? Should we be working with John's farmers who have the equipment already? We provide the research and yep. the technological, whatever, with our drones, our imagery, variable this and variable that, sampling and analysis and statistics. So I do see uh, this becoming really important in how we are going to be kind of changing. Like right now, we have our own tractors. We have our own plot combines. We're used to that approach. The young folks, our new faculty members, I doubt should have that approach. They should be thinking about, oh, no, I need to have a computer lab. I need that processing power. I need this network of uh, people uh, out there uh, to be working with. So um, yeah. anyway, I just throw that out there. I, I think you just uh, found a new topic for further conversations, <laughs> uh, Mario. So thank you for that. Uh, I would like to thank Jennifer, John and Mario for a pleasant hour. Uh, it was really nice to, to hear your voices and, and your opinions and, and knowledge. Uh, we are uh, planning for a, for a number of uh, faculty conversations in the new year. And so please uh, check our social media to um, um, get the latest news on that. Uh, or you could also visit us uh, at makemanitoba.ca. Also, if you uh, uh, do not already receive the Ag e-news, uh, you can email us at agfoodsci at umanitoba.ca to sign up. And then you will get our uh, lots of information about all of the great work that, uh, that our faculty is doing. So I would like to thank you very much for, uh, for listening uh, this afternoon. Uh, have a pleasant evening and uh, until next time. Bye-bye.